Hello, my name is Mr. Anderson, and my classroom is a video game. I can't think of a better way to start a story than Alice falling down the rabbit hole, and she comes upon a bottle, and the bottle says simply, drink me. And so I'm a teacher, and so I wanted to try to recreate that. And so what I did is I left my computer in my class, and I had angry birds on it, and then I had a card next to it, and it simply said the word, play. And then I walked away. But I wanted to see what would happen. And so I left the webcam on. And so I've got a little video of the kids as they come into class. And so would you like to see that? Yeah. yeah. As if you have an option. <laughs> yeah. I love how they took turns. And I love Jackson's eyes, if you watch him. <laughs> yes! Success! And so uh, that look in his eyes, that look of learning and trying something new and failing and trying it again, uh, is something that we aspire to see in the eyes of our kids. And we don't do that. A lot of the time it's glazed over look. Um, and so. I wanted to try to apply some of these uh, dynamics into my classroom. So I grew up in the 1980s playing video games, and these video games taught me lessons that I think we could apply in schools today. The first thing I learned is that video games are fun, and school should be fun as well. Unfortunately, most kids wouldn't say their typical day is fun. However, there are elements of uh, school that all students love. They love seeing their friends, and they love learning. Unfortunately, they spend most of the day just passively sitting in front, sitting, listening to a teacher uh, lecture. So I think school should be fun. Second thing I learned is that failure is okay. If it takes you 80 times to, to clear the third elevator stage in Donkey Kong, that's okay. Failure is simply part of the learning process. However, in schools, we tend to stigmatize failure. You don't get to take a quiz over and over and over again until you finally pass it. In fact, failure of individuals, and right now, failure of schools, is highly stigmatized. And so I think we need to send a message that failure is okay. The third thing I learned is the importance of leveling. This could be applied in schools in two ways. When a teacher decides to move at a specific pace, that's okay for some of the students in their class, but some of the students are automatically going to be bored, and some of the students are, uh, are quickly going to be confused. And so I think that students should be able to move on their own pace through a mastery system where they master a level and then they can move on to the next one. They also should be able to level up, becoming more powerful as they learn new material in the class. I also think um, that we give the wrong lecture at the beginning of the year. And I used to give this lecture at the beginning of the year. I would say, you all have an A. From this point forward, you will fall precipitously until you eventually land at your final grade. No game would ever be designed this way. And so, one of the great things about being a teacher is that you get summer break. And summer break is great because you get a break from school, but you also can reinvent your class, make it something that has never been before. And so, um, if you try to do that during the year, if you try to make radical changes, the kids will just simply be confused. But if you change it during the summer, you can make huge sweeping changes in your class, and the kids will never know what hit them. And so this was my dream. I wanted to reinvent my class as a video game. But I didn't want the kids to just sit in front and watch a video game like Oregon Trail or Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego. I wanted to take the most compelling elements of gaming and then apply it in the, in the classroom. This took a lot of work. And so I had to create a class. It's called Biohazard 5. It's got a narrator. It's got a narrative. All the kids come together there. Um, I've created about 100 video podcasts that take them through the lecture. And so when they get that point, they can kind of learn. Um, I have all these special activities, so in class, the kids can apply the material that we're, we're learning in the real world. I have a bunch of inquiry labs. This one right here is a photosynthesis lab. You can see my students very riveted. Uh, <laughs> they're studying photosynthesis right on using little uh, uh, chads that we cut out of a leaf. I've developed hundreds of questions, and I have a mastery system where the students can take quizzes over and over and over again it, until they finally get it. 
Um, I have a leveling system, so they start with zero experience points at the beginning of the year. I borrowed this from Lee Sheldon at University of uh, Indiana. So basically, they come in on day one. I invented the bottom level as primordial soup because I teach biology. And so they gain experience points and they can move their way up to like Dumbo Octopus and Mountain Gorilla and maybe Grand Master at the end. Uh, I also have a leaderboard. So they play with an avatar and they can see how they're doing uh, in the class, how, they can, how they're doing against everybody else. This is the most popular resource in the class. Kids are constantly logging in to see how they stack up. I also got to pilot a classroom set of iPads, and so kids had an uh, internet-connected device at all times. And so, finally, the summer was over, and I stood in front of the class, like this, apparently. Um, <laughs> and I said, Hello, my name is Mr. Anderson, and my class is a video game. So what I want you to do is grab an iPad, I want you to log into Biohazard 5. I want you to watch a video. I want you to do some reading. I want you to take a quiz, and then I want you to head off into the class. Now, if I would have done this with my students' parents, it would have been the most frustrating day of my life. Um, but the kids grew up with this technology, and the technology today simply works. And so they were headed off on their own. And so my class is a learning classroom. If you were to come in, you would find kids reading, watching videos, applying, uh, doing special activities, trying to solve challenges, working together or working alone. And so it's a really neat... I had a teacher come, and he was, we were just talking about halfway through the class, and he said, what you've created is like a shop class. Because he was a shop teacher at once, and he said, so as a shop teacher, you teach them some skills, and then the kids can apply that. And so it's like that. Um, I would love to keep telling you about how great it is, um, how the test scores seem to be going up, and how the kids are learning how to learn independently. But I am a science teacher, and that's not what gets us excited. In science, what gets us excited is discovering something new. And so I want to talk about three ways that I failed. Number one, a conventional classroom is like a school bus where all the students log in, they just get on, and the teacher is like the bus driver, and it drives from point A to point B, and you can make sure that all the students get there. And so what I had done is I had given each of them a brand new car, keys, and I said, drive. And so some of them stalled out, and some of them raced ahead, and some of them drove right into a wall. And so uh, I, I, I need to give them more scaffolding next year. The next thing I learned is the importance of reading. Kids struggled with reading when you make your class independent. And I should have seen this coming because it's the biggest indicator of success. And I think the reason I didn't see it coming is that I had never stopped talking because that's what good teachers do. We read the book, and then we come up with really good uh, examples, and then we present it in a dynamic way, and the kids can just sit there, and then they can learn it. Why would they want to read the book? We read it for them. And so when I force them to read the book, a lot of them struggle, and we've had to work with that. The last thing I learned is that we are not Vulcans. In the most recent Star Trek movie, uh, young Spock sits in a little module, and he's surrounded by computer screens, and the computer keeps throwing questions at him in philosophy and relativity, and that's his school day. He just sits in a little module like that. And so a lot of people think that they can change education by somehow using videos or automating the learning process. That, that sucks. Who would want to be in a school like that? Kids are coming to school to be social. And so I had to element, add elements of, uh, of social learning in my class to make it more compelling. And so this is a TED Talk. And so all good TED Talks always end with a call to action. And so what can you do? Um, and so I think schools need to move from a passive teacher-centered learning environment to an active student-centered learning environment. And that's what I did. I was off to the side now. I was a mentor in the class. So how do we do that? Well, if you're a student, you give feedback to your teachers. Everything I do in my class is a result I've got, is, is a result of feedback I've gotten from my students. What do you do if you're a parent? You write an email if you want your schools to change. The only emails I get from parents are complaining about their, their student's grade. I never get, an, my student has, my kid has an A in your class, 
but I have problems with the philosophy of your class. That doesn't happen. And so the message you're sending teachers is that the grade is the only thing that's important. But maybe you're not a parent, and maybe you're not a student, but you are a human. And so what's the lesson? What's in the bottle? What's in there? It's your passion. It's the one thing that you want to do. Can you figure out what my passion is? I love my family, and I love teaching. And if you can drink that bottle, also remembering to fail, learn, and then repeat the process over again, then I think you'll have a life worth living. Thank you.